book of Hebrews. Amen. I spent Tuesday night, last night, spent some time in studying and prayer, and I'm excited for the, the message tonight. Uh, we've been studying on the basics, the, uh, the basics of the Christian life. First, we started with salvation. And uh, just talking about uh, how we're saved and born again, putting our faith and trust in the Lord, what that means to us as a Christian. And that's always a good thing to go over and to help you to know what verses to use when you lead somebody to the Lord. How, how can you take them through the Bible? Many of you know, but just in case, I always like to give that out there because soul winning is a big part of the Christian life, amen, reaching people with the gospel, amen. And then we went over baptism last week and how baptism is important in the local church and how that we are baptized after that we're saved. This week we're just going to talk about the local church. We're just going to talk about the church, its place in our lives, and just uh, in the order of the church and some different things like that. And uh, I'm excited for that. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 is where we start. The Bible says, uh, "...not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching." Amen. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Thank you again, Father Lord, for the opportunity we get to be in the house of God. Thank you, Father Lord, that we get a chance to teach and preach the Word of God. Lord, how much that I love Lord, taking the Word of God and opening it up, and Lord, learning and studying Your Word, and just ask that Holy Spirit, the same truths that I received, the same uh, uh, verses that I've studied, that You've, Lord, allowed me to learn and understand, that, Lord, may You uh, also allow everyone in the room, Lord, to study the Word of God, to know, Lord, what the Bible says, and that we would grow and be better Christians tonight because of it, Lord. Would You please speak to every heart, Holy Spirit, even the young ones, even the children, Lord, and Holy Spirit, work on their hearts if they need to be saved, that you'd continue to work on every heart that hears the Word of God and that we would increase in faith because of it. Lord, we love you. We thank you. I ask that you would please would guide us and direct us as we study your Word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the local church is very important in the life of a Christian. Uh, a strong, Bible-believing, missions-minded, sin-hating, Christ-exalting, soul-winning Baptist church is very essential in the growth of every Christian. Just as for a baby, it is important to eat, it is important to uh, have the, the nutrients to grow, so is the local church important in the life of every Christian. For the believer, the local assembly should be, a, should be one around which he can build his life. We want to build our lives around the church. God's given us the church in, in, in this time and the, uh, through the Lord Jesus as He started the church. He's given us the church to center our lives around that we can build our lives on and that we can grow. Now, the, the word church uh, comes from, uh, uh, from the Greek and all of that, and, but we don't need that, amen. You just study English, amen. But it's found approximately 114 times in the New Testament. And we know that the church was... Uh, the Bible calls the children of Israel the church in the New Testament, but they used uh, the tabernacle, they used the temple uh, then that the Lord gave them, the, and then the Lord came in the New Testament when Jesus was born, and then he, and he died, of course, but He came and He started the local church. That's why the word church is, is found mostly in the New Testament. It's found referring to what God has given to us now that the Lord Jesus started. Now, the, church, the, ch the word church means a called-out assembly. The word church means a called out assembly. Why does I believe that God used that? Because we are called out of the world. We're saved. We're born again. We're different. The Bible says we are pilgrims. We are strangers. And the church is to be a called out assembly. Notice there in verse uh, 25 we talk about it says the assembling of ourselves together. Church is to be a place where we assemble ourselves together. Now, an interesting piece, you can uh, uh, read your Bible and study a little bit. Church, when usually the, the word church is mentioned, of course we know, and, and let me back up and rephrase, church is not just about a building and not just about walls and pews and all of that. The church is God's people. We're saved, we're born again, we are the church. We are a called out assembly. When we join together, we are a body, the Bible says. We are the church. When God refers to the place of worship, He refers to it as the house of God. You can study in your Bible and, and study the house of God refers to the place of worship. And there's multiple times that the, word, the, house of, that the words the house of God is used. And uh, we won't go there tonight, but to show that God has a specific place 
that he wants us to worship. That's number one. The local church, there is a place of worship. God has designed it that the church is to be a called out assembly of believers and we are called out and we organize, we assemble together at the house of God. A lot of people sometimes will say, well, I don't have to go to church. I can go to church in my home. But God says it's not so. There's a place. Now, a church can be in a home, but a church is made up of a pastor and people that are called out together that is started out of another church and assembled together for the purpose of edifying the church. You can't go, and some, some, some will say, well, I can have church at home by myself watching the TV and watching uh, Joel Olstein. And uh, that's not church, amen. Church is when you call out, when you assemble together with other believers. A lot of times, a lot of people are confused by the TV evangelists that allow them, that, that are put on on Sunday to think that that is church for themselves. When God says he wants us to go to church, amen, to go, as David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. It's the same example in the New Testament. God wants us to go. God wants us to have a specific place that we worship. Now, Jesus, uh, letter A, Jesus is the founder of the church. We know that, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus is the rock, the chief cornerstone that, we are, that the church is built upon. We have to understand that the place, the church, is founded by Jesus Christ. Amen. We want to uh, establish ourselves upon the Lord because anybody can come along and start a church, but Jesus only started one church, and that's what we want to build ourselves upon. We want to build ourselves upon the church that Jesus founded. I could go out and start, you call, I call it whatever I want. In, in, our, in a Hutchinson, they, they, they started a church called Cross Point and, uh, and all this stuff. I mean, people, you can go out and somebody can just start a church and teach whatever they want. But that's why God has designed it that each church if it's to be the true church, it's established upon its founder, and that's Jesus Christ. That will keep it true. That will keep it by the Word of God. If, if they uh, focus on Jesus as their founder, amen. We can, like I said, somebody can go out, start whatever, but if they want to be the church that Jesus started, they've got to found themselves not only upon uh, the church that Jesus started, but upon His doctrine and principles. Jesus is the head of the church. Not only did He found the church, He started the church, but he's the head of the church, Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Not only, do we, not only did Jesus found the church, but he's the head of the church. And in talking about how that Jesus is the focal point of all that we do. Jesus ought to be the focus of all that we do. Everything that we believe, everything that we abide by, all that we do and say and teach, all of our doctrine is based upon Jesus Christ, the head of the body. A lot of times pastors will get a big head about themselves and think that they are in control, that they are the, the, the top dog, amen? But in God's church, Jesus is the head. The pastor is just an under-shepherd. Jesus controls. Jesus rules the church. And then I mentioned earlier, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen. We want to remember that Jesus is what we're about. Amen. We establish ourselves as a church. We're not just here because somebody just decided to come out here and start a church in this piece of land because another church got a burden because the way it works, another church got a burden to plant a church. They sent somebody out like they did Paul and Barnabas. They separated them to the gospel. They sent them out and somebody started this church. Amen. Based on uh, uh, or from their church. It was sent out. It wasn't just something that just popped up. It was sent out. And then you go and it goes back and, for, and just back and each church is started by another church, by another church. Where somebody gets a burden, the Holy Spirit separates and that church has begun. But Jesus is the founder of our church, amen. We want to remember that Jesus is, the, is, uh, is, who, we, uh, is who we focus on. This place is about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But now the purpose of the church. So we know that the Lord has a place. God has a specific place that he wants you to go. Yes, the church is God's people, but the place is the house of God. But what is the purpose of the church? In general, the purpose of the church should be to evangelize the lost and edify the saved. Amen. God says, go. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 14, 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain. Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So God has designed it that the purpose of the church, amen, is to reach the lost. You say, why are we here tonight? Why have we gathered? Because the second purpose of the church is to edify the saved. Edify the saves. If Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 12. The Bible says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I'm getting warm up here, amen. But God has designed it. Our church, we want to be about Jesus. We, want to, we are founded on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be a biblical church. We want to found ourselves on the Bible. Then God says we have to remember then what is the purpose. Because God will only bless a church that achieves His goal for the church. And God's goal is, number one, to reach the lost. Amen? Anybody and everybody. Amen? Go out. Tell everybody. Bring them in. Amen? Reach them. Uh, preach to them the gospel. Be witnesses into this old world. God says if a church is not winning souls, God's not going to bless it. God can't bless a church that doesn't reach the lost. Because that was God's design. God told them to go and bring forth fruit. Amen. In our lives, if we are non-fruit-bearing Christians, then we are non-growing Christians. A church that does not bear fruit is a church that won't grow. Amen. Now, there are, and Joel Osteen's grown, his church has grown, but it's not God's fruit. We want God's fruit. We want God's increase. And to increase God's, uh, and to do it, God, and to get God's increase, we've got to do it God's way. Amen. And that's where we go and preach the gospel. That's the purpose of the church. Every church, every fundamental independent Baptist church must be focused and put their minds on the purpose of reaching the lost. Amen. We can't just gather here together and just be here just because, you know, we want to have some place to go on Sunday. No, we gather together to be encouraged, to edify, to be built up, to grow, but then the ultimate purpose is to go out and reach those that have not the gospel. Amen. Somebody reached you. The Holy Spirit used somebody that had a burden to reach the lost, whether through, the, whether through preaching a message or whether through handing a gospel tract. Whatever, however you were reached, somebody was doing the purpose of the church. And that's how... You and I were reached. Now it's our turn to take what we've been handed. Somebody gave to us because somebody was concerned and somebody gave to us. Now we've got to take what we've been handed and continue it. Because if we don't continue, then we're one generation away from being extinct. Amen? You're one generation away. If you don't take the gospel and give it to just somebody else, then we've lost our purpose. Amen? Church is not a place to gather just because for the fun of it. Church is not a place to gather to watch a show on the stage. Church is not a place to gather just to come and, and have a, an excuse uh, on Sunday. Church is a place that we gather, we're encouraged, and then we go and reach the lost. Amen. That's what God's goal is for the church. Amen. God says, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. Amen. God wants us not to just go out and win the lost, but God wants us to bring him in. That his house would be full. Amen. God wants the world to be saved. And God has given that task of reaching the world to the local church. Your task that God's given to you as a member of this church is now to reach the world. Amen. And that command is to every Christian, but the command was given to the local church to go 
and bring them in. And then we edify the saved. Ephesians 4.12, for the perfecting of the saints. Amen. You, uh, a lot of people think, that, you know, they'll tell you, well, I can grow at home. God says it's not possible. You will not be the Christian that God wants you to be when you're not in church. Amen. Now, does that mean, uh, now, does that mean, now look, some people say, well, then that means I have to come to church when I'm sick. I don't want what you have. Amen. If you have a fever, that's different. If there's, there's excuses, amen, God makes room for that. But if we're talking about consistent, amen, we're talking about not making it, amen, not being in church. If you consistently strive to miss the house of God, then God says you'll never grow as you should because church is to perfect the saints, amen. Church is to challenge the saints. Church is to edify, to build up to teach you what God expects from His Word, to encourage you to go back out in that week, and then we all together, we pray, amen, and we, we use that to, to lift each other up, amen. God calls us a body. We all work together. Church is something we come and we all work together, not just to reach the lost, but to help each other, amen. I know my dad was the pastor for many years, and, you know, when a church is in one accord, when a church works together, Boy, so much can be done. So much can be accomplished when we all have one mind and we all have one purpose that we know that God has given to us. But a church that, and I've seen it in 15 years, my dad's pastored, where when a church becomes divided, where the people begin to separate in their, in their heart and mind against the pastor and against God, then a church begins to be hindered. A church's spirit begins to be tainted. Because we've forgotten the purpose. Amen. We begin to begin to gossip and begin to mock and begin to be hard-hearted towards God. We must humble ourselves and remember the purpose of our church. Amen. Now, number three, the pattern. God gives a pattern in the New Testament for the local church. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is a great, uh, a, a great portion of Scripture to study, but God gives a pattern for how He wants the local church, what He expects, what needs to be done. The best New Testament, church, New Testament pattern is right here in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're going to start there. The Bible says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The first thing... That, must be, that we learn from this pattern is that in a church, there must be Bible teaching. There must be doctrine. Amen. The, they that gladly received His word, in verse 41, were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. These people were added to the church. They were added that day at the day of Pentecost. Now, what happens with this church after they're added? They continued steadfastly. Amen. They held on as tight as they could to the apostles' doctrine, to the Word of God. In a local church, there must be sound Bible teaching based on the Word of God for that church to continue. Amen? That's why at the church we teach the Bible. Every time I get up, I teach and I preach, and one day when we have Sunday schools and we have uh, more classes and things, everything we do must be Bible, biblical teaching, doctrinal teaching based on the Word of God. Otherwise, we won't grow. Amen? It's like trying to give your child uh, Cheetos and expect them just to grow on Cheetos. Doesn't work. They've got the, to have what God has given to, for the body to grow. They've got to have the necessary ingredients. And a church will not grow if there's not sound Bible teaching. Amen? So when you come, expect that we will have teaching based on God's Word. Amen. We're not going to get up and read a newspaper or read the Southern Baptist Convention's uh, Sunday school for the week and how they send out the sermons and all of that. We, we don't do that. We focus on God's Word. Number two, for a, uh, what else should be in, the, in a local church? Look there. It says they continue the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. There should be Christian fellowship. Amen. When we get together in the gym and have fun and play games and eat snacks and do all the and drink pop and soda and all the good things of life. Amen. That's fellowship. God says we should have fellowship. We should have fun. Amen. God's not against fun. God's not against letting your hair down and kicking your shoes off and, and running around and having fun. God wants there to be fellowship. It's necessary 
for us to grow. Amen? Because we begin to be united through fellowship. The more time we spend together, the more time we enjoy, and even time we spend uh, painting, and, and, uh, or, or, well, the time we spend taping and watching the, the man over there painting. Amen? That t- it's fellowship together. We learn about each other. We begin to grow. God says there's got to be fellowship. Amen? If a church has no time to communicate with each other, we don't even know we go to church together. <laughs> Amen? Fellowship. That's why we have handshaking time. We spend a small portion of our time with fellowship. It brings a spirit of unity when there's fellowship in the local church. Amen? And that fellowship should be with all brethren. Amen? That Christian fellowship is not just to you and somebody else. Amen? That Christian fellowship is between all of us. That's why God also says that we shouldn't, uh, 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 there shouldn't be cliques in the church. And, and Paul talked to the Corinthians and how that uh, there was divisions in the church. And God wants there to be fellowship among the church. Amen. Not divisions, not cliques, not me, myself, and this person. God wants all of us to get along, all of us to be in unity together. Amen. Christian fellowship. Number three, what's the next pattern? Or what's the next thing in the, in the pattern? The Bible says, and in breaking of bread. That's talking about the Lord's Supper. Coming up, we're going to have the Lord's Supper as a church and explain what it is to have the Lord's Supper. But the Lord's Supper is an ordinance. It's, the, it's a command for the local church. It is biblical. Now, the other denominations and other churches have taken the Lord's Supper and thrown it out of proportion, but God has a definite... A command in His Word for the Lord's Supper. Amen. When we have the time of the bread and the juice, amen, we drink the juice and not alcohol. Amen. God's design. Amen. But there must be the Lord's Supper. There must be time in a church where a church has the Lord's Supper. Now, God says for the Lord's Supper, and, and, and you can, again, we won't go there tonight. We'll talk more about it, but it's as oft as you will. There's not a set amount of times to have the Lord's Supper, but as long as it's done at least once, God gives that command to the, lo- to the local church. Number four, what should there be? There should be prayer. Look, Acts 2.42, uh, the fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. There should be prayer in the local church, prayer for each other. Amen. Prayer, not just on a Wednesday night, but we'll have times where we'll have a Saturday or something, a church prayer meeting where we come together and pray for God's power, pray that God will use us. But prayer should not just be a church-wide thing. Prayer should be an individual thing. Prayer should be a thing that we all do on a daily basis, begging for God's power. Every individual must pray. Every individual, every family must have time they pray together. Amen? That the church may go on. That the church may increase. We must have prayer. We must get a hold of God and ask God to help us. Number five, they feared God. There must be a fear of God in a local church. Look to Acts 2, 3 there. And fear came upon every soul. Amen. Now, of course, we know that fear is not talking about a, uh, a, just a scared of who God is, but it's a respect for who the Lord is, a respect for God. We know and we understand we respect the Lord. We respect God and His place in the church. God says that there are many, uh, in, in, uh, or Paul talks about in the New Testament, how many, like Ananias and Sapphira, that they lied to the Holy Spirit. There was no fear of God in their eyes. Amen. In a church, there must be a fear of God. There must be a respect for God and who He is. Amen. Understand that God is, uh, like the Bible says, be not deceived that God is not mocked. When you take the Lord's Supper, God says, don't do it unworthily. Because God takes vengeance, amen? God says there should not be discord. God says it's an abomination to the man that sows discord among the brethren. We must have a fear of God in our church. Our children must be taught to have a respect for God. That's why we don't take God's name in vain. That's why in, in, you shouldn't take God's name in vain. Because that's not having a fear of God. Of course, that's also a commandment. Exodus 20, you can look it up there. God says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Why? Because that it, it decreases a respect for God. I work in the pediatric department right now, and how many children that come in, I've heard, use God's name in vain. And I want to just come out there and slap something. 
Because that's God we're talking about. That's Jesus Christ. That's the God that made the heavens and the earth. That's the God that stepped out and created the universe and gives us eternal salvation. How dare we use God's name in vain? Don't let your children do it. Don't let it be a joke. Don't let it be done in jest. May there be a healthy respect for God. Because you remember, I won't take vengeance upon you. God will. Amen. Let your children see a fear of God, a respect for God, and a respect for God's house. May they remember when they go to church that we're going to God's house. Amen. May there be a respect in their eyes for the things of God. So many children grow up in our Christian homes and leave at the age of 18. Why? I believe they're not taught a respect for God. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But if they're never taught, they'll never have anything to not depart from. Amen. Let your children be taught a fear of God. What else should be in a local church? Acts 2.44. There should be unity. And all that believed, and all that believed were together and had all things common. Amen. There should be unity in a local church. There must be a unity in the purpose, in the goal of reaching the gospel, but there must also be unity, one mind, in wanting to love the Lord and and wanting to give to God and give God everything and, and going forward. Amen. There can't be a division in our doctrine or a division even amongst ourselves because of petty problems. God says, put those things away. May there be unity among each other. God says, forgive the brethren. Amen. God says, be long-suffering, be patient. Allow there to be unity. There should not be anybody that walks through those doors that you would not want to sit by you. There shouldn't be anybody that walks through those doors that you would say, I, can't, I, I don't want them here. Amen. God says can't be that way. There must be unity in the church. We can't have our cliques where we get to where we uh, don't want to include a certain family because maybe they're not uh, what we would have them be or they're not the Christians that they ought to be. But God says we should have unity together. Amen. We used to have a man come to our church there in Hutchinson. His name was Emery Shuff. And he got saved, got baptized, and joined the church. And uh, But, man, he... I mean, he, he did not have running water, and he did not have, uh, it, like his house, uh, did not have a lot of th- modern conveniences that we have. And so when he came, let me tell you, it stunk pretty bad. Whew. I mean, you could smell him the moment he walked through the door. It was terrible. He wouldn't shower for four weeks, didn't have a razor, so he couldn't shave. And uh, his parents just kind of just didn't have anything to do with him. And I saw the most Christian thing ever. I never, I mean, when I was a teenager, you know, we just kind of, you know, we were like, oh, stay away from Emory. I mean, we weren't very Christian about it. But I watched a family in our church invite Brother Emory to their home and an older couple wash his clothes, give him a place to take a shower, give him food to eat, and, brother, and give him a razor to shave with. And he would come to church week after week, and slowly he began to not stink and begin to be more... Uh, uh, pleasant in his appearance. But I watched a family give to the Lord by providing for his needs. And it reminded me of what a church is about, amen, about providing for the needs of each other, seeing where maybe we can be a blessing, seeing where God says even a cup of cold water given in my name is for me. Amen. We must have unity and have all things in common. Then next, Acts 2.45 there, it says, And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, and every man had need. Now, I'm not going to tell you to sell everything you have. <laughs> but, the, but the principle here is they were a giving church. God gave them and pressed upon their hearts. As you read the New Testament, he says that uh, as, as a man purposeth in his heart, so give. God put a purpose in their heart to give, and they sold everything they have as the Holy Spirit led them. That's why Peter met them and, said, and asked Ananias and Sapphira why they would lie to the Holy Spirit by keeping back when they knew what they were supposed to give and what they told God they would give. Amen. God's not asking us to sell everything, but God is asking us to give when He puts upon our hearts to give. A church does not, that does not give... The Bible says is a, well, or, or the verse here the Bible talks about is where the treasure 
uh, where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. You can always tell where your treasure is by where, by where you're willing to put your money. Amen. Giving is a tough thing to do. Giving is a humbling thing to do. But God says we ought to be a giving church. But not just in our money, in giving of our time, in giving of our hearts, in giving of our compassion, in giving of ourselves to God and for His work. Amen. Being at church is giving time, helping people, feeding people, giving a, giving a meal here or there, or helping giving a ride to church. That's giving to God. God says we have to be a giving church. Amen. Be compassionate in our giving. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. God wants a giving church. Next, Acts 2.46, it says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Amen. They continued daily. Now, we, don't ha we do not have church services daily. Amen. But we have our church services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night that we have out there on the sign in the bulletin everywhere that people will know what the services are. God wants us to have a principle in our lives, a conviction that we would continue with one accord, that we would, as Hebrews 10, 26 says, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. God wants it to be a, a principle of faithful attendance to His house. Amen. Not skipping here or there or when we feel like it or when we don't. God wants it to be faithful in our attendance. Be there as much as you can. Amen. God wants it to, 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 God wants it to be continuing with one accord. Amen. God wants us to be faithful to His house. Why? So we can grow. So we can be edified. So that our children see the importance of the house of God in our lives. By putting God first. By giving God the preeminence in all that we do. You'll never go wrong by giving God first place. Your family will never go wrong by giving God first place. Amen. Now, there were times in, in, in where I was, I, know, I remember, like I said, I was sick, and I remember having a fever and laying in my mom's office because mom and dad had to be at church, the pastor and pastor's wife. They didn't have an excuse. <laughs> so I had to go to church, but I laid in my dad's office and or maybe my mom's office and was sick and she would come in and check on me and I'd have a bucket where her trash can and I would puke in her trash can then they'd come in and count the money and I'd lay there. <laughs> I mean, it was a mess. But I remember that mom and dad made it a principle that we were faithful in attendance to the house of God. And it taught me an importance in, my, in the family, an importance in my life that I must be at the house of God. America is in the mess that she's in. You know why? Because the churches are empty and the movie theaters are full. The churches are empty and all-star sports is still in business on a Wednesday night. The churches are empty, but every other place of business is able to be run. Why? Because somebody's not faithfully attending the house of God. God wants us to be faithful in attendance as much as you can. Now again, God makes, uh, God gives places for uh, for things when we're sick or when we're uh, not able to make it. A car breaks down or wh wh whatever we can do. But God says, with all your might, as much as you can, faithful in attendance. Why to grow? Not just because we want a number. You've got to get out of your mind that you don't do it for yourself or you don't do it for the pastor, but we do it for God because we love God. We want to grow. We want our family to be reached. We want our children to be saved. We have to put a, a, a preeminence on the house of God, doing things for the Lord Jesus Christ. So many Christians make it a, a fly by the seat of their pants. God says, make it, make it something so important for your children that when they grow up, they'll remember a mommy and a daddy that love to be in church. Our families are a wreck. Pastor's kids that I know are a mess because they just aren't faithful. God says, a faithful man, who can find? God says, when he comes, will he find faith? Amen. God wants it. God desires it. And if we don't do it for God, then don't do it at all. Amen. Next, Acts 2.47 there. Praising God and having favor with all the people. 
We are to be a church that praises God. Now, not a praise and worship, amen. We're not going to get a band up here and start uh, uh, doing holy roller down the aisle and, and having all kinds of that nonsense. That's not praising God. That's a show. That's to bring attention to themselves. But a praising God where we give honor and glory to God in our music where we have a testimony time of we thank God for what He's done in our lives. Be willing to say, praise the Lord. Guess what God's done? Amen. God's idea of giving praise is not rolling down an aisle and speaking in tongues. But God's idea of praise is lifting up in music and giving God the glory for what He's done. A church that praises God. Never be a part of a church that calls praising God, a praise and worship time. That's modern. That's a modern, techno, uh, that's a modern term. That's an excuse to not have Bible teaching. Because the praise and worship time, it, 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 it uh, clouds out the teaching of the Word of God. The bands, they are more of put on the pedestal than the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. I know, I've seen it. I've seen the churches do it. I've seen in my town how they have advertised they're bringing in whatever group. But they don't advertise the preaching of the Word of God because it's not preached. I remember I was knocking on a door. And this guy, I answered the door, him and his wife, and he had a couple children. And I said, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. He goes, you know, I've been thinking about it. He says, we go to the, we go to the cross point. He says, you know, he says, I just am tired of it. I said, well, what, you know, I said, I've never really been there. I said, what's going on? He's like, well, they don't teach the Bible. He said, it's a, it's a rock concert. He's like, I've been to them. And I thought, man, sad that a church becomes more about a show than it does about the Bible. We are to praise God, but we are to do it in a godly way. Amen. And then last, Acts 2.47 there, praising God, having favor with all people. And it says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. A local New Testament church must follow the pattern of soul winning, where Jesus sent them out two by two, where he says, Go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. A church must be soul winning to follow the true New Testament pattern of what God's purpose is for the church. Now, number four, the people. It's a called out assembly. We know that. Acts 5.14, it says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. Baptized believers who desire to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. As Hebrews 10.25 says, We should faithfully attend all the services of the church because we are the people of the church. Amen. And we've gone through that. Number five, the personnel. What is the order of the church? God has ordained two offices of the local church. Amen. We abide by these, by the doctrine of God's word, and God has ordained two offices, the pastor and the deacon. Scriptural church government is the democratic administration of what the Bible says under pastoral leadership. A Baptist church should be self-governing coming under Christ as its head. In other words, we don't answer to the Southern Baptist Convention. We don't answer to the American Baptist Association. and We don't answer to uh, all the different denominational heads that are out there. We are a self-governing church. What we do and say is between us and no other church. Amen. Now, does that, that does not mean that we don't get advice and we don't ask for uh, maybe uh, somebody, an evangelist to come in and preach and teach. Not talking about that, but talking about we make decisions for our church and we are self-governing, but we come under Christ as our head. Christ is our leader and the pastor is just the under-shepherd. Amen. The pastor makes the administrative decisions under the guidance of of the Holy Spirit of God. Every decision goes through the pastor, but the pastor is to be in such a way that he is as close to God making the decisions based on what he believes God would have them be. Now, there are a few different words to describe the pastor's office in the New Testament. Bishop, meaning overseer. There's the word elder, which is defined as a ruler. And then pastor, which is a shepherd. Each word gives an insight into the, the job of a pastor. A bishop is an overseer. He oversees the church. He oversees the doings. and the, He oversees the Sunday school, the ministries of the church. The elder is defined as a ruler, not as a dictator, 
but as one that makes the decisions final. And then the pastor is the shepherd. He is to guide gently and lovingly the flock of God and to feed the flock of God. Now, these three things uh, uh, can be um, mentioned here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. We can turn there and then be just about finished. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. The Bible says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Then he gives, a command, gives some instruction. Excuse me. He says, number one, feed the flock of God. A pastor should give the people the milk and the meat of the word that they may grow thereby. A pastor that is not willing to preach the whole counsel of the word of God is not doing his job. Amen. When you one day, maybe God moves you. Maybe God takes you somewhere else and you find another church to go to. You find a church that a pastor preaches the whole counsel of God. That's not going to hold back just because he fears the tithers or he fears the deacons. or the, he, he preaches the word of God. And a pastor to hold back is doing against God's command for him and his job. God is his uh, boss, and so to speak. I answer to God and nobody else for the messages that are preached. God will deal with me if they are not according to his word, but I am to preach according to his word and hold back nothing. Amen. To feed the flock. People will not grow if it, the word of God is not taught and preached and everything in it from cover to cover. Amen. To hold back would be to hold you back as a Christian. Number two, to take the oversight. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. A pastor is to take the oversight. He is to rule the church. He is to take care of the ministries. He is to look at the finances and he is to oversee the workings of the New Testament church. Not by constraint, but willingly. Amen. He's not to do it because he has to. He does it because he loves to do it. A pastor does it because he loves to. Amen. He's willing. Amen. And then not for filthy lucre. Pastor shouldn't be in it for money. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be doing it because, well, if I'm not paid enough, I won't do it. No, you do it willingly. God will provide for his needs. And then, but of a ready mind. Now, and then last, be an example. Amen. Be an, a pastor should be an example. As he follows Christ, he should be a mold after which God's people can pattern their lives. That's why God says he shouldn't be a novice. Amen. He should be well-grounded, established in the faith. And then the last office is a deacon. The word deacon is defined as a servant or minister. A deacon is a servant to the church. Amen. Brother Ken is our deacon here. Amen. So if you need anything done, uh, now you know that's what he's... No, I'm kidding. Amen. But he is the servant to the church, which he has been for so many years. A great example. But a deacon is to serve. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7 gives the history and necessity of where the deacons became first involved in the local church and why they had to be done. The, the, uh, and God gives us in other areas of Scripture a deacons and his responsibilities and how they should be. But their pr goal is to be a servant to the church, amen, which I believe Brother Ken is a great example of. Now, God intends for every believer to be an active member of their church. But God wants every believer to know the pattern that the New Testament church is to be. That way they know how to keep their church and, what to, and, and to know where their church should be and where it should be headed. Amen. And for his own growth and the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen, every Christian should find the church that God would have him to be a part of. Amen. God has a, you, God has, uh, has a, a church in mind that he wants you to be specifically a part of. I believe it's this church. But God may move you one day. That's God's plan. Amen. And you find, and through prayer, the church that God would have you be. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the time.